uh, carry on. So we have just been seeing uh, how they treat each other, uh, and uh, this is how you live in harmony. This is the way harmony happens, and uh, so then it goes on, and. Uh, he says, I think, why don't I set aside my own ideas and just go along with these venerables ideas? Yeah, this is a great way of living in harmony, not taking your own ideas too seriously, but uh, letting go of your ideas when you feel it leads to problems and just, okay, I can, you know, happy to just do whatever, it doesn't really matter so much. And I like this, one of these things that, uh, you know, sometimes you hear this, uh, that the, it's actually not the choice you make that is most important, but how you implement that choice is actually often more important than the choice that you make. And if you implement it well, then almost any choice can be successful. So sometimes we think the choice itself matters enormously, but uh, actually in Buddhism I think implementation is far more important uh, than the actual choice. Uh, so you set your own things aside and you do what the other ones want. Uh, and that's what I do. Though we are different in body, sir, uh, uh, we are one in mind, uh, as it were, or so it seems to me. Uh, so, uh, different in body, but working together in harmony, uh, as if you are one in mind. It's kind of nice. All right. And the Venerables Nandiya and Kimbala spoke likewise, and they added, uh, that's how we live in harmony, appreciating each other without quarreling, blending like milk and water, uh, regarding each other with kindly eyes. Good, good, Anuruddha and friends, says the Buddha. But I hope you are living diligently, keen and resolute. So uh, now we are kind of... Uh, Moving on a little bit, so uh, first of all, are you living in harmony? That's the foundation, and once the foundation is in place, then well, what about living diligently? What does this mean? And you will see here that there are three words down here that are diligent, keen, and resolute. You have apamatta, which is uh, here rendered as diligent, and you have atapino, which is uh, rendered as uh, keen, and then pahitatta, which is uh, resolute. So, what do these words actually mean? And uh, apamatta is the same as apamada, right? Uh, and uh, apamada means something like uh, heedful. Uh, yeah, you know the word heedful. Uh, yeah, heedful means like careful. Uh, it means circumspect. Uh, it means you think before you act. Uh, it means that you. Uh, you know, you consider things properly. That's all the meanings of the idea of heedful in English. So, for that reason, I think diligent to me misses the mark a little bit. Because diligent means like you work really hard. Yeah, You're diligent with your work or whatever. But this is more about how you think. You use yoni somanasikara, you use wise attention. You use satisampajanya, clear comprehension or full awareness of what you're doing. Yeah, yeah? so you... Uh, you, you don't do things hastily, uh, but you are considered in your approach to life and what you're doing. Uh. So this is like the wisdom aspect. You bring wisdom into your activities and your daily life. Then you have the second word here, atapi. And atapi is uh, closely related to the ideas of vayama or padana, which is effort on the Buddhist path. Uh, yeah, so you make an effort. Uh, it is... Um, also a little bit related to the idea of energy, the energy of the mind, in other words, having that uh, energy to do things. Uh, the word atapi actually comes from the idea of tapas. Tapas is like the uh, idea of ascetic practices. Uh, so that's why sometimes atapi is translated as ardent, because ardent has to do with fire, it's a bit like ascetic practices. Uh, but ardent is a word that nobody uses these days, uh, so nobody knows what it means, you have to have a dictionary to look it up. Uh, <laughs> But it, but it really means that you're putting forth an effort or you are energetic in a certain way. Yeah? So you have wisdom, you have energy. And then pahitatta. Pahitatta is a, a similar kind of word. Uh, it means it's the past participle that uh, it relates to the idea of making effort. So it means something like effortful or something like that. Uh, uh, here rendered as resolute. Uh, 
Yeah, so the ideas here are really effort and wisdom coming together is what kind of this really is about. Uh, so I would probably have rendered this something as uh, uh, maybe as um, a heedful, heedful, diligent, he heedful, keen and diligent maybe, something like that. Uh, I might be my, my preferred rendering of these things. Uh, but uh, So this is what this is about. Yeah? Are you being wise? Are you putting forth effort? Uh, this is what the Buddha is asking about here. Huh? So this is on page 20, bottom of page 28. <clears throat> and then they reply, Indeed, sir, we live heedfully. And etc. And all the other ones. How do you live in this way? Now this is interesting, right? So we now know that they are living in harmony. So how do you live diligently? How do you live heedfully? This is the answer. And this is pro probably also going to surprise you, the answer to this particular question. I assume you haven't read it yet, but maybe, <laughs> maybe that is the wrong assumption. Um, so what is the answer to this? And this is a kind of a, an answer you might not expect, right? So here, let's see what he has to say here. In this case, sir, whoever returns first from arms around, uh, prepares the seats uh, and puts out the drinking water and the rubbish bin. Uh. If there's anything left over, whoever returns last eats it if they like. Uh. Otherwise, they throw it out where there is little greenery uh, or they drop it into water with little life or no life uh, or no living creatures. Then they put away the seats, the drinking water, the rubbish bin, and they sweep the refectory, like the din dining hall. Uh. If someone sees that the pot of water for washing, drinking, or the toilet is empty, they set it out. Uh. If he can't do it, he summons another with a wave of the hand, uh, and they set it up by lifting it with their hands, uh, but they don't break into speech for that reason. Uh. Every five days we sit together for the whole night and discuss the teachings. That is how we live heedful, keen and diligent. So uh, this is the effort that they make. Yeah? We still haven't really got to the meditation part. Uh, we're still kind of dealing with the more basic things. How do you div live wisely in your ordinary life? And. Uh, Basically, it is just a continuation of what we saw before, really. It is more about living in harmony and how to not just live in harmony, but living in harmony in a way that is conducive to peace. They don't really talk at all. There's no speech. Yeah? Even if you have to do something together, you just wave people over with a hand by hand signal, uh, and then you do it by, you know, and then that's kind of how they work together. Uh. And then every five days, you sit together the whole night uh, and you discuss the teachings. Uh. Sabbaratting. I wonder whether it means the whole day, actually. I'm not sure if it means the whole day or the whole night. And anyway, it means some, something like that. So you have Dhamma discussions uh, on a regular basis, uh, and apart from those Dhamma discussions, you are quiet, and you just get on with your job, uh, and you work together in harmony in this way. Uh. Ratti means night. It also means day. Uh. It means like a 24-hour period. Uh. If you say one day in English, often you mean like a 24-hour period, uh, and the, rut, the part the part of the word rut is used in the same way here. Uh. So it means both night, and it also means 24-hour period. So maybe it means, uh, it's hard to know exactly what it means here, but uh, prob it may very well mean night, actually. Uh. So let's stick with night. So, uh, yeah, it doesn't really add maybe all that much to what we saw before, uh, but uh, it sort of gives you an idea how these... Uh, monks are living together, yeah, a very kind of uh, easy and uh, peaceful lifestyle there. But uh, so now we have laid a bit more of the foundations and now comes the really interesting part uh, because now we come to the results of this kind of living, yeah. This, these are, now we have laid down the causes, uh, the conditions uh, that uh, make results possible. These are the cause and conditions. Uh, this is what really matters. Uh, so what about the results? Uh, now we get to the results. Uh,
Good, good, Anuruddha and friends. But as you live heedfully in this way, yeah, with keenness and also with uh, uh, diligence, uh, have you achieved any superhuman distinction in knowledge and vision worthy of the noble ones uh, and meditation at ease? So uh, these are, now we're coming to the results of the path. Yeah, they, we have the uh, superhuman, uh, these are the uh, Uttari Manusadama and his superhuman insight or superhuman knowledge. Uh, he has here put it all together into one long phrase, but I prefer have you achieved any superhuman uh, qualities uh, and have you achieved a distinction in knowledge and vision worthy of the noble ones. Uh, so what does a superhuman quality mean? What are these superhuman qualities? What does it mean even to be superhuman? What it means really is to go beyond the ordinary human world, uh, the ordinary human experience. That's why it's called superhuman, because it is beyond ordinary human experience. Uh, what is ordinary human experience? It's the five senses. Uh, what is beyond the ordinary human experience? It's beyond the five senses. That's essentially what it uh, is referring to here. Uh, so. Uh, what are these things? Well, they are four stages of awakening and the four jhanas. This is the superhuman qualities. And um, what is interesting about this is, and this is something that you see again and again in the suttas, uh, is that the four stages of awakening are often lumped together with the four jhanas. Four jhanas and four stages of awakening are con considered one group of qualities uh, that are basically what the purpose of the monastic path, not the, the entire spiritual path, I should say, uh, the purpose of the entire spiritual path. Uh, four stages of awakening and the four jhanas together. Uh, and uh, uh, with the four stages of awakening, it's kind of obvious why they are the culmination of the path. But what about the four jhanas? Uh, they're also part of the path, right? Uh, but of course, they are the culmination of the path in the sense that they are with the path, the last part of the path. So you are very close to actually achieving, achieving the stages of awakening here. But it's very fascinating because it means that these jhana states are considered something very special in Buddhism. Yeah, they are on par with the stages of awakening in terms of their qualities, in terms of their otherworldliness, in terms of leaving the world behind, in terms of the joy and happiness that you get, all of these kind of things, they form a separate category. You are almost out of existence, almost out of this world when you get to these jhana states. And this is very important because very often we have these discussions and arguments about what are these jhana states. Yeah? I was just discussing with someone here the other day. He's, he's going to remain nameless. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm being I'm being naughty <laughs> about the meaning of some of these things. <laughs> Name and form, that's right. Uh, and uh, so, but so the point is that um, because the jhanas are grouped together with the stages of awakening, it means that they are very profound things. Uh, and whenever someone says that the jhanas are easy to attain uh, and that they are fairly ordinary, and that you can think and ponder while you're in the jhana and you can kind of hear sounds and see things and all of these kind of things, uh, it's very problematic because they are essentially at the very end of the Buddhist path. Uh, these are the results of the path. These are the things that we should look for. Uh, when you come to these jhana states, you have achieved what is called the footprint. You have come to the footstep of the Tathagata, the Tathagata Pada. You know when you get to the jhanas, the Buddha must have been here because that's how profound they are. You can't really go to the end of the path without going through these qualities. So whenever, so one of my principles for deciding what is a real jhana is that whoever speaks about the jhana is the mo in the most profound way is the one who is most likely to be correct. Because it is very unlikely that you can actually go beyond the jhana, that you can say something which is too profound because there isn't really much beyond the jhana apart from the stages of awakening, right? So because there isn't much beyond, it means that the most profound person is likely to be correct about these things. So when you compare people describing jhana, if I were you, I would always go with the person who is most profound about these things. That is the most likely to be true. 
precisely because of the way it is talked about. Uttari manusadhamma, superhuman qualities. These are really extraordinary and exceptional. And the other uh, qualification here, the other way it is described, as a distinction in knowledge and vision uh, worthy of the noble ones. Uh, distinction in knowledge and vision worthy of noble ones. And that's also very interesting. First, again, worthy of the noble ones. Uh, now, the noble ones, of course, are the people who have attained the four stages of awakening. Uh, so again, we are in that category yeah, of the stages of awakening. That's what the jhanas are in that realm, uh, seeing the same thing again. Uh, but what is interesting here is the idea of knowledge and vision, right? The jhanas are called knowledge and vision. That is not normally how you think about jhana. You see it down here, it's down here, jnana dasana. How can jhana be jnana dasana? And this is uh, what is so interesting, that sometimes we, I think we misunderstand what these things actually are. We tend to think of jhana as a samatha or samadhi, something which has to do with the calming of the mind. But the way it is described in the suttas, like here, it is actually a form of knowledge and vision. And the reason is because when you go, enter into a state like this, a very profound state, the data, the understanding that you get by entering that state is actually very profound. And when you come out afterwards, you bring that understanding with you, and it alters your entire view of the world when you come out. And that's why these things are knowledge and visions, because coming out afterwards, you're no longer the same person. We talked yesterday about the idea of a positive trauma. Yeah? So positive trauma it means you're no longer the same person afterwards. So what you have seen, you have seen an alternative reality. You have seen for the first time what it means to leave behind the entire sensory world once and for all, entering a new existence. And because you have seen that, your understanding of the world is transformed. You understand that the entire sensory realm is not really interesting anymore. You have left it behind, you have found something more profound, something more meaningful, something deeper than you have ever experienced before in your life. The sensory realm no longer holds any interest to you after that. This is why it is knowledge and vision, because you have understood something about the nature of life, about the meaning of life itself. And this is also what you find in the Dhammapada, where the Buddha says that there is no jhana without wisdom, there's no wisdom without jhana. The one who has both is in the presence of Nibbana, Nibbana Santike. Yeah? So in other words, wisdom and deep meditation go together. They are two sides of the same coin. You cannot really separate them. And this is this whole idea that samatha and vipassana always go together on the Buddhist path. There is no separate samatha meditation and separate vipassana meditation. There is only meditation, and that meditation brings with it two qualities, samatha and vipassana. The deeper the samatha, the more vipassana you have. The deeper the vipassana, the more samatha you have. This is a very deep samatha, samadhi, jhana, so it brings with it also very deep vipassana as part of it. They are, go together, they cannot be separated. It's a very important principle of Dhamma that you see everywhere. And so this whole idea that somehow Vipassana and Samatha should be separated as different meditation techniques, it, it is not, this is not how the Buddha taught. And I think it's important to, to realize that. Yeah, so this is knowledge and vision worthy of the noble ones. In other words, profound knowledge and vision. Not only that, but it is a distinction in knowledge and vision. Distinction means something special, something high, something unique, something, uh, you know, you get um, grades in school with the distinction because it is very uh, profound and uh, what you have done on, on that particular, or very, you have done very well at school or whatever. Uh, yes, yeah, so you can start to get the feeling here that we are talking about very profound qualities when the Buddha is talking about this. The four jhanas and the four stages of awakening is what he's talking about. Uh, and then the last thing here is a meditation at ease. Yeah? Pasu viharo. And um, sometimes the jhanas are called the ditta dhamma sukha vihara. Uh, happy abiding is in the present life. Uh, and here they are called pasu vihara. It literally means like a comfortable abiding, right? Uh, and this is what I, one of the things I like about the word of the Buddha. It is often very understated. Uh, 
Yeah, he, the Buddha doesn't overstate things. When the Buddha says a comfortable abiding, he means like really, really, really comfortable, right? It's not just chilling like this. So that's, that's, not, that's not comfortable abiding here. This is like a really profound comfortable abiding here. And uh, these jhana states are such that, you know, you feel complete ease when you come out of them. And this is kind of why they are so beautiful. You can sit in a one posture without moving for two days uh, and uh, you, when you come out you feel utterly at ease when you come out afterwards yeah there's no pains there's no aches uh, if you try to sit uh, you know still for two days without moving you're going to feel terrible you're going to have pains and aches everywhere but if you do it via jhana you feel more relaxed than ever before uh, and that's kind of the cool things about this so it's a paso vihara in the highest sense of the word you are really relaxed really at ease really chilled uh, and uh, and that's kind of the, uh, the beauty of these particular states. So, have you achieved any of these things? Now we're coming really down to the nitty-gritty, yeah? So have they had any success? Okay, the foundations are in place. What are the results? Well, sir... Uh, Actually, let's stop there, because it's a nice place to stop. And let's do a few minutes of meditation, and then we'll come back to the next part in a second.
Okay, so um, all right. Any comments or questions, please? Uh, Does vision mean uh, insight, uh, is the question. Uh, uh, knowledge and vision is, uh, I, I should maybe explain it a little bit. Knowledge and vision is the usual kind of uh, words used in the suttas to mean insight, yes. Uh, and uh, one of the kind of classic expressions in the suttas is uh, yata bhuta jnana dasana, which means to see things in accordance with reality. Uh, and you find this in a standard sequence called dependent liberation, you find this kind of sequence. And dependent liberation is one of the beautiful sequences in the suttas. And it starts off with sila, with morality, yeah, kindness. And because you live with sila, you have no regret, avipatisari. Because you have no regret, you have pamuja, gladness. Because you have gladness, you have piti, piti, rapture, yeah, that joy. From the piti, then you get pasadi, which is tranquility and calm. From tranquility comes bliss, sukha. From bliss comes samadhi, samadhi, the uh, stillness of the mind. And from samadhi comes yata, bhuta, nanadasana, knowledge and vision according to reality. Uh, so this is meditation seen from the perspective of how it feels like personally. Uh, when you do meditation and it works, you go through that sequence of steps. This is what it feels like. Bliss, more bliss, even more bliss. Peace, which is also bliss, even more bliss. Stillness, even more, happy, you know, so it's bliss upon bliss upon bliss all the way, more and more bliss, and eventually you see things according to reality. So uh, the Buddhist path is all about bliss and then an insight depending on bliss. It's a pretty good deal, right? Uh, yeah. <laughs> I was, I, I, yeah. You, you almost, almost explode. Almost, you know, you're almost unsure what's going to happen to you because so much bliss. Can I take all this bliss? That's one of those questions people have sometimes. Uh, so uh, it is true. So uh, please, yes. Yeah, Jan, I think still regarding the jhana, it appears to me that jhana is very difficult to achieve. <clears throat> but there's one monk, American monk, that say it's not true. He said most of his people that attend his retreat at least achieve one jhana. Everyone achieves one jhana on retreat. Huh? Yeah, he said during his retreat, most people achieve jhana. A kind of Skeptical about the comment. <laughs> so, I think you'll comment on that. Okay. Um, the, the problem is that there is a lot of uh, disagreement about the meaning of jhana in the world. There are lots of arguments. If you go on the internet, people are arguing, and some people call it, some, some types of jhana are called jhana light, other ones are called jhana, kind of the, the more serious jhana, whatever you want to call it. Uh, uh, and so that's why it is important to have some kind of uh, rules of thumb to decide what is the real jhana or not. Uh, uh, otherwise, we're actually going to be led astray about what it actually means. Uh, and this is what I've been trying to do here, kind of give a rule of thumb. It is very profound, yeah? And uh, it is profound because it is always mentioned together with the four stages of awakening. Yeah? Jhana is called Sambodha Sukha, which means the happiness of awakening. Yeah? So the happiness in jhana is roughly equivalent to the happiness of awakening. Yeah, It's actually difficult to read take them apart. The difference is that awakening also has insight, uh, but the happiness is of a similar kind. Uh, and so for that reason, when I hear the most profound explanation of jhana, I take that to be the real one, not the more shallow explanations, because the consistency in the suttas of how profound it is, found everywhere in the suttas. Uh. So uh, for that reason, um, is it hard to, I, I don't know if hard is the right word, it is more like it takes a lot of dedication and commitment to achieve them. Because it's not hard, it's not like learning mathematics, you know, it's not kind of that kind of hard. Uh, it has more to do with having all the preparation in place. Uh, if the preparation is not there, you can't achieve it, it's not hard, it's impossible. But if the preparation is there, well then you will achieve it. Uh, so it's just a matter of preparing the ground and then it will happen automatically. Uh, so I think hard is maybe not quite the right word, uh, but it does certainly take commitment and dedication to, to achieve them. Uh, sometimes people complain, they say, well, you know, it, if, if jhanas are so profound, then nobody's going to get them, and you know, we want to get them, so that's bad, eh, that they are so profound. Uh, but uh, the point is not whether 
it is bad or not that people don't get them. The point is that you have to understand them in the right way. If you don't understand them in the right way, you cannot fulfill the Noble Eightfold Path. It's impossible. If you get the idea wrong of what a jhana is, you're never going to fulfill the path because you have the wrong ideas. And if you don't fulfill the path, you're not going to get the results of the path. So it matters enormously that we actually get these things right. Otherwise, we're destroying the possibility of practicing the path. But the beautiful thing about all of this is that there is enormous amounts of happiness and joy and stillness to be had before you get to the jhanas. I just mentioned the sequence of dependent liberation to the lady in front here. That you start off with sila. Pamudja is, is already gladness. Then you have piti, which is more joy. Then you have pasadi, which is more tranquility. Then you have bliss, which is even more tranquility. All of that, even before you get to the jhana. So there's like more bliss, even more bliss, even more peace. And it's just astonishing how much happiness there is to be had on this path when you start to look at it that way. So that makes the jhana even more kind of exciting, right? Because they are, after all of this bliss, there's even more bliss beyond. And that's kind of where the jhanas eventually are. So it's actually an extraordinarily interesting path, really, really exciting. Yeah? And the amount of uh, joy and meaning and happiness is almost unimaginable on this Buddhist path. Yeah? I'm going to hog the mic. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Ajahn, this sentence in this sutta about the uh, leftover. Leftovers? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Is it otherwise they throw it out where there is little that grows yeah. or drop it into the water that has no living creatures? Yeah. Uh, my question is why is that? Why do they throw it in these two places? Um. Er, yeah, it's a good question. I dear, <laughs> now that you mentioned it, uh, um, I thought I knew the answer to that one. Huh? But maybe I don't. Uh, yeah, it's, it's right here. Apaharite chadeti. Apaharite means where there's little greenery, quite literally. Huh? I think what it means, uh, harite is often a word for crops, so it may mean where there are no crops. So you don't destroy the crops of someone. Huh? And where there is no apanake, udake. Huh? Um, why, why there should be no living creatures in the water? Maybe, maybe there is a danger that you will kill the living creatures. I don't know. It, it sounds like you're feeding, going to feed them. It doesn't sound like you're going to kill them. <laughs> but maybe that's the idea. That you, I think the general idea is that you don't want to destroy any life, whether it is uh, crops or greenery or, uh, or living. I think that's the idea. But exactly why that is happening, I'm not sure in this case. Uh, there must be some meaning behind this that I'm not quite aware of. Uh, so, uh, sorry to give such a disappointing answer, but uh, that's, uh, yeah. Because my idea is that when there's leftovers, we leave it to the little creatures to eat. Yeah, yeah. yeah and that, so is, that is actually, the, that, precisely, that is actually the correct way of thinking. That's a good point. Uh, and uh, there is, is actually suttas that say that. So even, it says that even if you have a little bit of leftover food in your arms bowl, if you pour it out with the intention, may the little creatures feed on this, you're making merit already. Yeah? It's kind of nice. I, I love those kind of ideas. So thank you for bringing that up. Be because what it means, uh, actually, it is quite easy to make merit sometimes. It's quite easy to make good karma. With good karma, all you have to do is change the state of mind that you have. Uh, almost anything can be good karma. You know, I'm sitting here talking to you. I can just ramble on forever and talk randomly. Or I can have the good intention to say something which is helpful. And that dif difference makes the difference of whether I'm making good karma or not. Uh, so thanks for reminding me of that. I try, try to make better karma. Uh, but the same thing with you. Every time, even if you ask a question, right? Uh, that question can come from a certain intention or not. Uh, every time you have some food left over, and I have every day when I eat, I usually have a little bit of food left over, I can either just ra throw it out without thinking about it, uh, or I can actually give it to some little creature like that. Uh, so and, and as long as we... We can permeate our lives uh, with this idea of good intentions. And every time we have good intentions, uh, actually, then we are actually doing something positive for our own spiritual path. 
and helping other creatures at the same time. So, indeed. Uh, good. Uh, Ajahn? Oh, I'm here. Over there, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Ajahn, just now you mentioned depending on liberation. Is it the same as uh, Abhidbhujanga, the seven factors of enlightenment? It is very, very closely connected to each other. So when you see the bojangas, they also depend on each other. They also have a sequence. The first bojanga leads to the second bojanga. The second bojanga leads to the third one. So they are actually connected causally. And the bojangas are very similar because in the bojangas you start with sati sam bojanga, the uh, the mindfulness awake. In fact, bojanga is the factors of awakening. By the way, in case you don't know, so they have the mindfulness factor of awakening, which leads to the dhamma vichaya sam bojanga, which is the factor of awakening of. Uh, investigating qualities, uh, and the, that leads to the energy sambhojanga, which is the, uh, or the virya sambhojanga, the fact of awakening of energy, which leads to the piti sambhojanga, the fact of awakening of uh, rapture, which leads to the pasadi sambhojanga, the fact of awakening of tranquility, which leads to the samadhi sambhojanga, the fact of awakening of stillness, which leads to the upeka sambhojanga, the fact of awakening of equanimity. Now, if you look at those factors, you will see in there, you see Piti, rapture, you see tranquility, and you see samadhi, right? Uh, that is very similar, that sequence is very similar to the other dependent liberation sequence. If you put them next to each other, you can see the similarities. Uh, and that's what I sometimes do on retreat, I kind of put these things up next to each other to point it out. Uh, and, then you can and then you can take the um, uh, Anapanasati Sutta, yeah? put that next to them as well. And that Anapanasati Sutta, which is the mindfulness of breathing sutta, also has very similar kind of qualities. It has piti, sukha, tranquility, all in there. And you can see the parallel all the way across. So everything that has to do with meditation and the development of the mind, the sequences are roughly the same, but there are slight differences to show you the different ways in which the mind develops. Yeah? There's kind of variations on the theme to give a broader view of what is happening here. So yes. Thank you, Ajay. Yeah. One over here, uh, Ange, just a... um, I think Ajahn, the, uh, the mentions is about the path is about really building up on the bliss and the bliss upon bliss and happiness upon happiness. I think, uh, speaking from personal experience, I think a lot of time when we reach a certain stillness yeah. in some meditation, then oftentimes I sabotage myself yeah. by saying I don't deserve this. You know, ah. this, this, this feels strange. Um, I can only speak from my own experience when the mind gets still, it feels, feels kind of strange. Yeah. Okay. It's strange because it's not familiar. Yeah. Um, I'm familiar with the thinking, the busyness, the, the whole thing. So mm. it's a lot of time this, this, this self-doubt and kind of you know, I don't deserve this yeah. kind of feeling, kind of, kind of, kind of just, okay. just, there's always this block yeah. that says, although you say it's a good deal, but it's like, <laughs> it's like I don't deserve a good deal, you know, that's, you know, that's just speaking from experience. How, how do we uh, sort of, uh, yeah. you know, deal with such a, such okay. a you know, issue? Yeah. Okay, that's a, that's a good question. Yeah, that this is uh, something that is, uh, uh, happens to, happens sometimes, people have these kind of feelings uh, that they don't deserve it or whatever. Uh, but you know, you deserve it. I'm just going <laughs> to... <So that's laughs> it is not about this. This is where the sense of self gets in the way. Because it's really the sense of self that says that. But uh, you know, that, and uh, so really, you just um, have to understand that the mind is just a natural phenomenon. Uh, and uh, it is not about you or about anything at all. It is just about natural phenomena working. Yeah. And you just get out of the way, you know, don't, don't interfere, it's not, it's not, there isn't any self anyway. You're kind of buying into the delusion of a self when you kind of have those ideas. Yeah. And familiar, yeah. yeah. I suppose what I, what I try to do, I don't know whether it's right, yeah. is just to say, uh, hang on, I think the Buddha is right. So, so it's like putting a little bit of trust into the unknown a little bit, rather than trying to be logical about it. Right, right. And, and, and that yeah. kind of helps a little bit. Helps a little bit. I'm not bit, sure, right. I'm not sure yeah. whether a little bit of that, yeah. that kind of trust, and you know, just, just releasing that, that control. But yeah. it's kind of hard with, without that, that, that faith element there, Yeah. to be, to be honest. Right, yeah, exactly. So that faith element is, is, is important. Uh, and you 
know that many people have been there before you because people attain these things all the time. You know, you hear about people attaining these things. So, so you know that they are there, both for lay people and for monastics. These things are available. Huh? So that confidence is well placed. Uh, yeah, and you read the suttas, you can probably recognize some of these things from the suttas uh, uh, as well. So a lot of it has to do with familiarity. And one of the things I would recommend every time you have such an experience, just to uh, contemplate it yeah, and start to see that how delightful it is because it actually is very delightful just because you are not used to it uh, uh, doesn't mean that uh, you know it is not worthwhile in fact it is enormously worthwhile huh? and once you start to get used to this kind of experience they become like second nature huh? and it's like your ordinary experience that you don't can't get used to anymore yeah you kind of get feeling that actually my ordinary experience isn't all that uh, interesting so it's a twofold thing this, gradual giving up of the ordinary five sense experience and understanding the downside of that uh, the more you understand the downside of that the more attractive these other experiences are going to seem because then they contrast with the downside of those ones uh, and secondly r focus on really contemplate the the uh, positive side of those experiences that seem strange uh, and as you do that the mind will gradually kind of uh, uh, be attracted to them uh, and they will seem less and less strange familiarity will grow until eventually they are the reality everything else is the non-reality this is normal everything else is abnormal uh, and then that's when you have really made it right uh, and then you kind of go into those things uh, and uh, and get the self out of the way the self is a problem but what are we going to look at now we're actually going to go into that theme right now with all of these upakilesas the thing that block meditation this is kind of part of it so Let's have a look at this now uh, and see what this gets us. Uh. All right. So the Buddha asks them, have you attained any of these superhuman qualities? Yeah? Distinction in knowledge and vision worthy of the noble ones. Meditation at ease. Uh. And Venerable Anuruddha replies, well, sir, while meditating, heedful, keen and diligent, uh, we perceived both light and vision of forms. But before long, the light and the vision of forms vanish. We haven't worked out the reason for that. Yeah, so uh, what is this light and vision of forms? What are we talking about here? What is the result that they are getting from the practice? Uh, and light and vision of forms, as we, as we uh, uh, as I think it's fairly clear, is basically the thing that uh, in the present day we call samadhi nimitta. Samadhi nimitta is like a light in the mind, yeah? like uh, the seeing of the moon or the sun or something like that in the mind. Uh, and this is light and form because that samadhi nimitta, as we call it now, is basically a form and a light together. It's an appearance of a shape together with a light in the mind. Uh. And this is what this seems to mean, and there are some other pointers also in, in that direction. So in the suttas, the word samadhi nimitta does not mean what we now... It, it occurs, the word occurs in the suttas, but it doesn't mean what we now mean by the word samadhi nimitta. In the suttas, the word samadhi nimitta means the basis for samadhi, the foundation for samadhi. If you like, the object or the subject of meditation, which becomes the basis for samadhi. So for example, in the suttas, they talk about the... A skeleton, yeah, and you can use a skeleton meditation to attain samadhi. That's the samadhi nimitta because it is the sign or the basis, foundation for samadhi. Yeah. So this is kind of interesting, right? The samadhi nimitta. You hear Ajahn Brahm talk about samadhi nimittas all the time, the bright light coming up in the mind, uh, and that at this point, that's where meditation becomes extremely interesting when these things start to happen, uh, and it becomes incredibly powerful, and you get really excited if you're not careful when these things start to happen to you. Uh. So this is what we're all heading towards. Yeah? This is where we are trying to achieve in many ways. This is the beginning of the experience of samadhi. Yeah? So here we have these famous monks uh, who are struggling with the kind of things that we are struggling with. Uh. Isn't that interesting? Yeah? Yeah, these are exactly the kind of meditation that we are all trying to achieve. Yeah? The samadhi nimittas, this peace of the mind in the same way. Yeah? And as we have seen, the way to get to this point is very simple. Basically, you have to be kind, basically you have to live well, metta and compassion all around, and as you do that, this is the result you can expect, just like these monks are achieving this. But, 
they are having a problem. Just like we have a problem, they have a problem. Before long, the light and the vision vanish. What happened? Ajahn Brahm, please help me. It's all gone. I was so happy and I got excited and now it's gone and I want it again. Please give it, I want it back again. Ajahn Brahm will say, don't want it back. Just enjoy what you have and it will come back or something like that. That's what I will tell you. Uh, and then they say, we haven't worked out the reason for this. Yeah? So now the Buddha is going to give them the reasons. So this is how we then find out how to sustain these deep meditations. Well, you should work out the reason for that, says the Buddha. Before my awakening, when I, when I was still unawakened but intent on awakening, it's getting familiar now every suit that we have this because I've specifically picked them out for that, I too perceived both light and vision of forms. Yeah, so even the Buddha to be has actually been going down the same path, trying to figure out what is going on. But before long, my light and vision of forms vanished. Yeah, said Buddha, even the Buddha to be has exactly the same problem. And again, we might ask the question, exactly when did this happen? When on the path? And we can assume, I think, that the time under the Bodhi tree went on for quite a while, maybe a few weeks, while he actually learned to deal with all of these kind of uh, defilements and things in the mind. It occurred to me, uh, what's the cause? What's the reason why my light and vision of forms vanish? It occurred to me, uh, doubt ar arose in me, and because of that, my immersion fell away. So uh, here we can see, first of all, the word immersion. Yeah? Uh, the word immersion here is samadhi. Uh, so we can now, from this, we can take it that uh, sometimes the samadhi does not mean jhana in the sutta. Sometimes it means like a pre-jhana state. Uh, and here we have the idea, even if you have that light and the forms in the mind, it can be called the samadhi. It's not yet Samma Samadhi, not yet the full Samadhi, but we are going in that direction. The mind is becoming very unified. But then there are all of these defilements, and one of these defilements, these Upakilesas, is doubt. Doubt is arising. So what does it mean that doubt arises in meditation? This is kind of the, kind of the interesting thing here. And the Pali word is Vichikicca, is usually a word for doubt. It is the fifth of the five hindrances. And um, uh, the meaning of Vichikicca, the way it is defined in the suttas, uh, it is defined as being uncertain uh, or having doubt about what are wholesome and unwholesome qualities. Uh, yeah, so you come to a certain point in your meditation, uh, there is a blockage, uh, you can't go any deeper than you already have. Uh, yeah? So why is it being blocked? Uh, and that is where you have doubt, you don't really understand what the blockage is in your meditation. And once you have that doubt, once that kind of the mind starts to think about that, or it starts to not really know what is going on, it doesn't know whether I should carry on watching the image, should I contemplate something, of course that is going to take you out of the meditation because you are uncertain about what is happening here. Yeah, because you start thinking about it, you start worrying about it, you start basically uh, proliferating about something you should not proliferate about. Uh, so doubt will always lead the mind astray. You have to have confidence, uh, confidence that you are on the right path. Uh, and this is what Nivern, Nivern was saying before, the idea that you, you, know, you have to have confidence that you are on the right track. Uh, otherwise the mind is going to withdraw from this. Uh, and so you abandon the doubt. Uh, you have confidence that you are doing the right thing. Why are you confident? Well, because these uh, nimittas, these lights and forms, they are very pure. Yeah, you can feel that the qualities are very good. You can feel the happiness and joy are there. The tranquility is there. Very beautiful qualities of mind. So they must be on the right track. Yeah. Okay, let me put the doubt to one side. So you contemplate what is going on. You let go of that um, uh, unpleasant uh, uh, or disturbing doubt. Uh, and then you can move on uh, as a result of that. Uh, don't allow the doubt to disturb you anymore. Yeah. So when immersion falls away, the light and vision of forms vanish, yeah? because you lost your immersion because of doubt. Uh, I will make sure that doubt will not arise in me again. While meditating, dil diligent, uh, keen and resolute, uh, I perceive both light and vision of forms. So this is the first thing 
that the Buddha to give us, gives up is the doubt, yeah? the last, if you like, of the five hindrances. And then he carries on, and again he perceives light and the vision of forms. But before long, my light and vision of forms vanished. It occurred to me, what's the cause, what's the reason why my light and vision of forms vanished? It occurred to me, loss of focus arose in me, and because of that, my immersion fell away. The Pali word is amanasikaro. And manasikara means like attention, right? Uh, you are attending on something and you're losing your attention on the object, losing the focus on the object, on the thing. Uh. And why is that happening? Well, sometimes it happens because you get distracted. Uh. Yeah. So let's say that there's a sound, for example, happening. At this point, uh, you have not yet entered the jhana, so you still have the five senses are still there. Maybe there's a disturbing sound around you. Uh. Maybe you are meditating too close to the village. There's this beautiful sutta which talks about uh, 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 the Buddha seeing a monk meditating close to the village. Uh, and he says, I'm not happy with that monk. Even though he's sitting in samadhi really, kind of really well, he looks like the perfect monk. Uh, the Buddha says, not happy with that monk. Uh, and then he, the Buddha sees another monk in the, in the forest. And this monk in the forest is kind of nodding away. Uh, yeah? really tired, and the Buddha says, that's my monk. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it, it, it's astonishing when you see that, because you think that's exactly what the Buddha would not say. You think the Buddha would say, well, as long as you get samadhi, you are okay, right? The nodding monk, forget about the nodding monk, the samadhi one is good, but actually he says the opposite. And it's a very interesting thing, because what it shows you that actually putting in the causes is more important than the results. If you put in the right causes, in the long run you're going to have good results. So being secluded is really the critical thing. That will ensure that you can sustain the uh, uh, samadhi in the long run. And this kind of amanasikara may very well happen precisely because you're sitting in the village. A noise happens, or maybe suddenly you start thinking about something, right? Your mind can, oh, I have to what about lunch, right? Uh, I'm a monk. If I don't get lunch now, yeah, I will miss my lunch. Oh, help. Uh, for monks, lunch is really important, right? Uh, that's the one meal of the day. If you don't get that, you are kind of... Uh, uh, actually, here we have a very nice breakfast. Here, the breakfast is really cool, so we, we can't really complain here. But if you have one meal a day, actually, one meal a day, if you don't get it, it actually is important, right? Uh, you can see why that is the case. Uh, so, uh, amanasikara, or anything else that is distracting, uh, you lose your attention. That is really what it means here, by losing focus. So, you have to make sure you stick with what you're doing. Yeah? When immersion falls away, the light and vision of forms vanish. I will make sure that neither doubt nor loss of focus will arise in me. While meditating, dullness and drowsiness arose in me. So you can see here that we are looking at the five hindrances. Uh, so first of all, we, almost like in reverse order, not quite. So we had the doubt and we had the loss of attention, which is maybe a little bit like restlessness. Yeah, the mind wanders a little bit. Uh, and now we have dullness and drowsiness. Uh, and what we are talking about here is a very small amount of dullness and drowsiness. Uh, you may not even understand it as dullness and drowsiness, uh, but the mind loses some of its brightness. Uh, yeah, for whatever reason, maybe it is a physical thing that you have eaten too much and suddenly it kind of kicks in. Uh, uh, or maybe that you, um, your energy reserve is used up for, for whatever reason, and some, something happens within your mind and body that then allows the dullness and drowsiness to come. Usually, you don't get dull and drowsy when you have these kind of qualities, because they are the opposite of dullness and drowsiness. Uh, but because the mind and body is so complex, uh, it can happen. And what it feels like in this case, it's like the light of the mind becomes more dim. You lose the brightness in the mind, yeah? That's why the light kind of dims down and eventually disappears altogether. Uh, that is a sign of dullness in the mind. Uh, the more bright the light is, uh, the less dullness there is, because the brightness, powerful energy in the mind is the I exact opposite of the dullness. Uh, and you feel really, really awake at these particular points. Uh, so you have to avoid the dullness and drowsiness. How do you avoid that? Well, basically by staying with the light in the mind, yeah? by focusing on it, uh, enjoying that kind of uh, 
uh, thing in the mind. That's how you kind of avoid these things to happen here. So you avoid the doubt by not uh, giving in to doubt, but by having confidence in the object. Uh, you avoid the um, non-attention by staying with the object, and here is a similar kind of thing. You stay with the brightness of the object. Uh, I'll make sure that neither doubt, nor loss of focus, nor dullness and drowsiness will arise in me again. While meditating, terror or fear, might be the better translation, uh, arose in me, and because of that my immersion fell away. So you become fearful. Why would you become fearful when you have so much bliss and happiness? And the reason you become fearful is because you are entering very unknown territory here. Yeah, this was like Niwen was saying before, you kind of you, this is unusual, this is something really weird going on here, I'm not used to this. And of course, very easily, then you can feel that you're kind of losing yourself. What happened to my old self? I could think, I could do all of these kind of things, now that self is kind of disappearing a bit. And the deeper the meditation goes, the more it feels like your self is disappearing. All the ordin ordinary signs of you, like the thinking mind, the mind which is able to will this and will that, uh, the mind, you know, the feelings of the body, the awareness of the five senses, all of that is fading away. You are entering into a very strange territory where you have never been before. Even though it is extremely pleasant, it is extremely happy, it is extremely still and peaceful, because it is unusual, you are feel a bit scared. And, and the deeper you go, yeah, you can kind of feel that you're losing yourself even more. And what if you can't get them back again? Right? What if you're giving up the sense of self for good? That's kind of really frightening. What about these senses? The, the moment you enter a jhana state, it's like you're giving up the senses once and for all, because you have to give them up completely to enter the jhana state. And because you have to give them up completely, it is like maybe they never come back again. Are you willing to give up the sense of sight once and for all? You can never hear anything again in the rest of your life. That is kind of the thing you have to do on the doorway to jhana. And that is why it can feel like a challenge to enter, yeah, because you're leaving something behind. But what you're leaving behind is actually rubbish. <laughs> so leave behind the rubbish, right? And enter something which is the opposite of rubbish. The gold, the diamond of the... Uh, of the mind, yeah, that kind of emerges out of this as you as you do this, uh, and so this is kind of the point. And one of the things that we also are letting go of at this particular point, which is very scary, or it's not actually scary, but we think it's scary, uh, and that is the ability to will, the ability to intend things. Uh, you can no longer will anything. Uh, you're leaving behind the doer, which does things, uh, and the doer is a very important part of who we set, take ourselves to be. Uh, yeah, we are the doers in the world. We are the creators. We are the things, the people who get things happening here. Create creativity, a very important part of human existence. Uh, so leaving that behind is also kind of uh, can feel scary, even though it actually isn't scary at all. Even though it is the happiest thing you've ever done, it looks from this side of thing, it can seem like it is frightening here. Uh. So you have to learn how to deal with these things. Uh, you have to learn why they are really happy, and eventually, as you learn that. Uh, you understand that this actually is very useful, then you give it up, and then you can enter these very powerful and uh, life-transforming states uh, as a consequence. Uh, yeah, and, but um, don't think that this is only for, for, for very advanced meditators. Uh, this is also for all of us, because all of us, we have these kind of issues. Uh, we have them maybe slightly more coarsely than what we're talking about here, but the same issues are there for everyone, regardless of if you are a beginner or you are more an advanced meditator. Yeah, sometimes you can feel a bit of fear. Where is this leading? Yeah. Certainly dullness and drowsiness. Yeah, most people know what that feels like in meditation. Yeah. And uh, that's kind of part of, uh, part of the thing we have to learn to deal with. So don't think that this is not relevant to you. It is relevant because uh, these things come in both coarse and refined manifestations. Yeah. When immersion falls away, the light and the vision of forms vanish. Suppose a person was traveling al along a road and killers were to spring out at them from both sides. They will feel terrified because of that. In the same way, terror arose in me. 
That's kind of an interesting simile, isn't it? <laughs> the killers emerge from both sides of the road. Uh, that is what meditation is like. Yeah. Are you sure you want to carry on with meditation? <laughs> so the idea, this is kind of an extraordinary simile, but the idea here, yeah, this is what, exactly what I was saying before, is that it, when you go deep in meditation, it feels like part of you has to be left behind. Part of you has to die almost, right? It's like the killer comes for, for that part of you and you leave it behind. But it's actually not really a killer, because what is happening, of course, is that even though you leave it behind, once you come out of that samadhi, you come back again. Yeah, you get back all of those things. And then when you come back, you think, oh no, I don't want them back anymore now. Yeah, finally got rid of that nonsense. Yeah, but now I have to take it back again. So suddenly your perspective is completely changed. Beforehand you are afraid of it. Afterwards you don't want it back again at all. That's kind of the interesting thing here. But it feels like a very important part of you has to be left behind. That's why the idea of killers, I think, is used here in the simile. Yeah. I will make sure that neither doubt, nor loss of focus, nor dullness and drowsiness, nor terror will arise in me. Yeah. While meditating, excitement arose in me. And because of that, my immersion fell away. Yeah. A very common experience for people who have some deep meditation, yeah? I hear about these things all the time. Uh, oh, I was getting, you have one kind of really powerful experience and then you get close and you get really, really excited. Yes, it's happening, it's happening, it's happening. Uh, and the moment you think that, destroyed, yeah? There's no way it's going to happen anymore because you've gone way over the top there. So this is the uh, excitement and after a while you learn that actually it's all about cause and effect. Uh, it all just happens naturally anyway. It's got nothing to do with you. There's nothing to be excited about. It's just nature taking its course. You just relax. If it happens, it happens. If it doesn't happen, it doesn't happen. It's fine with me because I don't exist anyway. <laughs> or something like that. Yeah? You just kind of stay with it. You enjoy what is there. You learn how to relax with whatever happens and you're happy with whatever happens. You know that these things are out of control. Whether you get excited or not, actually, that's got nothing to do with it. When nature is ready, these states will happen on their own. So you learn to go with the flow of things. You learn to just relax, sit back, and enjoy what is happening here. So, but excitement can be a problem. So uh, learn to see these things as nature taking its course, and then you are on the right track. When immersion falls away, the light and vision of forms vanish. Suppose a person was looking for the entrance to a hidden treasure. Yeah, this is what we're looking for here. We're looking for a treasure because these things are the highest treasures that human beings can experience, quite literally, in samadhi. So this is really what it is about, looking for gold, if you like. And all at once they would come across five entrances. They would feel excited because of that. Yeah, you have this excitement because suddenly you see the entrance to uh, the uh, samadhi here, uh, the entrance, entry, entryway here. Uh. Why is there five entrances? Uh? Five senses? <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure if the senses are called an entrance to samadhi though. I think that's, uh, that might be stretching the idea of uh, the senses a little bit. I, um, it is a good question why there is five, and it could be that it is the five jhanas, uh, usually only four jhanas, but sometimes there is five, uh, so maybe there's kind of five possibilities, uh, and you enter the, each jhana has a separate entrance, I'm not sure. Uh, uh, anyway, so you, uh, yeah, anyway, I, maybe the commentary has an answer to that one. I'll look it up later on and let you know what the commentary says. Uh. In the same way, excitement arose in me here. I'll make sure that neither doubt, nor loss of focus, nor dullness and drowsiness, nor terror, nor excitement will arise in me again. So you learn how to deal with each one of these defilements uh, in turn, uh, and then you go carry on. And while meditating, uh, discomfort uh, arose in me here. Uh, Tutulang, yeah. discomfort. Sometimes called inertia, which is a slightly strange word. I prefer discomfort, I think. I think this is a nice translation by 
Bhante Sujato here. I shouldn't always criticize him. I should praise him as well. That's well, well done, Bhante Sujato. <laughs> I'll make sure that neither doubt, uh, nor loss of focus, nor dullness and drowsiness, nor terror, nor excitement, nor discomfort will arise in me again. Uh, so uh, again, discomfort can arise because the senses are still operative at this point. Uh, what happens at this point in your meditation is that the senses are starting to fade away very powerfully. Uh, they're kind of in the background, but they haven't completely disappeared yet. Uh, and this is why, even at this place we are still usually doing anapanasati, mindfulness of breathing, yeah? The breath is kind of there in the background, functioning like an anchor to what you're doing, yeah? The prominent feeling, the prominent thing is the nimitta, the sign, the light and the form in your mind. That is the prominent thing that is there. Yeah? But the mind, the uh, breath is like in the background, like an anchor which is there that you can turn to if necessary. Yeah? Yeah, when it fades away or whatever, you can go back to the breath again, or the breath is there. But of course, as long as the body is there, there is also the potential for discomfort in the body. This kind of discomfort could also be a sound that penetrates the meditation. The last thing you want to hear is sound at this point. So if some loud person comes, comes around saying, Hey, where are you? Yeah, you will hear that like, like some, some, Sometimes like somewhere really far away, you hear this sound really, really far away, even if they're very close to you, huh? because it's like you have moved away from this whole five sense world. You're in a way into a different reality, and it feels like all of these things are kind of disappearing here. Yeah? But they can penetrate your shield of samadhi a little bit, and that can be uncomfortable, and that is what you're seeing at this particular point. Uh, so you learn to stay in seclusion, uh, you learn to go away from people, uh, you learn to not pay attention to the body, uh, come back to the breath, uh, focus back on the nimitta, and then you allow this uh, duttullang, uh, this uh, discomfort, to cease and disappear as a consequence. Uh. Okay, let's take another short meditation break.
Okay. <clears throat> so, uh, please, uh, if you wish to bring up anything, uh, now please do so. Uh, Ajahn. Uh, oh, Ajahn. Um, when I saw the list, when I first saw the list, I, I was thinking that this is going to be Panchan Nivarana, but seems like the list of uh, obstructions is endless and uh, is, is this sutta providing the definitive and complete list of obstructions or <laughs> will, will it be different for each and every one? I, I don't think there is a definitive list of obstructions. I, I don't think that, that such a list exists. I think you can always subdivide more and you can come up with new things. Uh, uh, but I think I think the five hindrances is really the definitive list, uh, and you can take it that all of these things that you see here are somehow included within the five hindrances. Uh, this is more like a finer, a f in some ways, a finer division. Like discomfort uh, probably is a kind of restlessness, uh, right? Uh, uh, and all of them can really somehow be included within those those five hindrances in one way or another. Uh, so I would argue the five hindrances are the final kind of listing, but this is just an alternative viewpoint on those five hindrances. And that's why it's useful to know that actually there, you know, there isn't any final thing. It's just how each one of us looks at it slightly differently, as you say, which I think is right, basically. Thank you, Ajahn. Yeah. Please, yeah. Yeah. If you don't have any questions, I will just drink coffee. So I <laughs> Please. Yeah, Ajahn. Uh, yeah, just you give a very good point. That is putting in the causes is more important, right? So I see here the Vatupama Sutta is a very good... Uh, one of the upakilesas, yeah, because he got about sixteen upakilesas there. Yeah, yeah. So if we can remove that uh, from ourselves, then it would be very, very good. So how to do that? How to do that? Uh, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, it's, it's interesting. I think the main way to do that is just to practice the noble eightfold path. You know. And uh, so, by if you always contemplate how can I live with kindness and live morally and not do bad things towards others, uh, actually those defilements will disappear automatically. Uh, it will just be part of that process of living well. Uh, uh, sometimes you may have some very strong defilements that are blocking you. You know, some people can be very arrogant, or some people can be very dominating, or they can be very uh, you know have some very powerful defilements. Uh, and for them, it might be useful to look at that list and see, okay, maybe I have a problem in these areas. And then you have to be very honest with yourself that actually, I have a problem here. I need to deal with this. Uh, but I think for most people, it's probably enough just to practice the Noble Eightfold Path and do all of those things. And I think that will undermine those defilements, generally speaking. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, so I would. That's basically what I would, would would tend to argue myself. Yeah, yeah. Sukiyo to Ajahn. Ajahn, can I get your opinion? So I heard that um, somebody said that the jhanas are related to the chakra points. It's like opening uh, of the chakra points. Uh -huh. uh, and also, do you think it has something to do with the pineal gland? Pineal gland. What has yeah. to do with the pineal gland? The jhanas. Jhanas, pineal gland, yeah. okay. Thank you. Uh, I th you know, th this is where, like, where we're tr starting to mix different religions together, you know? Because chakras is all about uh, Hinduism and, and kind of the, uh, the Vedanta and that kind of tradition. And then we are kind of saying that we're trying to kind of uh, point to similarities between the Hindu tradition and the Buddhist tradition. And is there similarities? Maybe there is, maybe there isn't. Uh, but I think that... Uh, you don't really need to kind of go, you know, I'm happy with what, the, I'm not sure if it's very helpful to think of it in terms of chakras, I'm not sure if it actually adds anything to the path. Uh, and I would just stay 
I prefer always to stay with the word of the Buddha because to me that is the final kind of answer to these things uh, and not to kind of bring in too many out external things. Uh, it may not be wrong, it may, maybe it will work for some, maybe it can give you some good ideas on how to make meditation work, but uh, generally speaking I would just stay with, the, uh, with what the suttas have to say. The pineal gland, <laughs> you know, I have no idea. I, I, well, the pineal gland is a physical thing, but these are purely mental experiences, so whether there is a, co a correlation or not, uh, maybe there is, maybe there isn't, I, I, I just have uh, no idea, to be honest with you. Anyway, <laughs> yeah. Yes, please, sir. Yeah, elaborate a little on the uh, Perceive light and vision of forms. Uh -huh. What does vision mean? Is it something imaginary? Is, is it something that uh, you see something in future? Uh, is it imaginary? It, no, not really. Uh, because uh, what it is, it's almost like uh, as you do this kind of practice, it's almost like the breath transforming almost. Uh, yeah. So uh, uh, there comes a point when uh, uh, there's like a, almost like a mental image of the breath or something like that actually is happening there. So the light is just a natural phenomenon of the mind and uh, this is what happens when the mind becomes peaceful and happy. You actually get these kind of visions. So it's not really imaginary because I think everyone has, you're not actually making them happen. They happen by themselves whether you want to or not. And it seems to be pretty universal that people have these experiences. But they can vary a little bit depending on your personality, and I think that is an important point. Uh, they can, the colors can be a bit different, the shapes can be a bit different, uh, and uh, there may even be some people who cannot actually have this kind of uh, visual nimittas. It's possible, but uh, generally speaking, I think people will have them. Uh, so there is a degree to which they are conditioned by personality, but the general idea seems to be universal that people have these things. Uh, so all you have to do is just wait. Uh, Relax, watch the breath, and allow it to happen. It will happen by itself. No need to imagine anything, no need to do anything. Yeah. It's an automatic process. That's the main point. Uh, yeah. Please, sir. Yeah. Uh, Achan, I, actually, this is the first time I'm attending this meditation course. I don't know much about meditation and everything. Okay. But uh, yeah. I think this course is very beneficial for me. I don't know. Uh, because yesterday, when I was doing the, the I just uh, explained, yesterday, when I was doing the death, the bait, the kind of uh, meditation, mm. I could feel, uh, I could see clouds of light. Uh, like, yeah, really? Uh, okay. Silver light coming out from my body. Cool. Okay. Yeah. Excellent. And then just now this morning I did one. The one, the, the forty-five minutes is very good. Yeah. I could see forms. Yeah. Form okay. Vision. I yeah. saw houses. You know, golden, yellow houses, <laughs> rose or red houses. Okay. But they okay. don't last long. Only nope. one or two yeah. seconds. Okay. Yeah. You know. Yeah. That's why. It's I, a badly built uh, house. Uh, yeah. That's why I experienced. <laughs> and yeah. this is my first time. You know. Yeah. Uh, just yeah. to know that it happens. Okay, cool. But if I yeah. tell others, they yeah. think that I'm going I'm crazy, but I don't know. No, no, I, I no that's, that's wonderful. I'm very happy to hear I that, actually. It, that's yeah. great. Yeah, yeah. Uh, okay. So, so, so one of the things that, yeah, so, so really, when you see a house, it's a very complicated form. Uh, so um, you want, rows you, of houses. Yeah, so you, yeah that's yeah. even more complicated. So you want to make it, very, you want to make it as simple as possible. Uh, okay. So that's only the beginning. Yeah, but light good, easy, but good. Well done. Yeah. Light easy to see. Yeah, the okay. House, the forms are a bit difficult. Take okay. a longer time. Okay. Okay. But next time I meditate, do we have to sit down on the, the, like, a, like a Buddha? Uh, you can do whatever you like. You can sit on a chair, you can sit down like a Buddha, you can sit down like okay. anything, whatever you want to do. Okay. Yeah, there's only, one, there's only one posture we don't recommend, that is standing on your head. Don't stand on your head. Eh? <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah, Thank you. Thank okay. You. Yeah, very good. Okay, let's, uh, so that, that, that's wonderful. I'm very happy that you're getting some nice results. That's really, really marvelous, actually, because that's the purpose of this path. Uh, and so that's actually a wonderful, wonderful thing. So well done. And also the beginner as well, that's really, really nice, isn't it? Uh, so uh, let's uh, have another break, everyone. Have a nice cup of tea or whatever, and we'll see you back in half an hour again. <laughs>